today, in the next hour, I'm going to share with you some research from this new book, The Giants of Stonehenge and Ancient Britain, because this is a remarkable story. I mean, if, if you're not aware of the whole giant phenomenon around the world, you may be surprised that, you know, we have uncovered thousands of accounts worldwide, especially uh, in Britain more recently and in North America. But I want to talk about this site, this very important new discovery first in southeast Turkey called Karahan Tepe, which is the sister site to um, Gebekli Tepe, which I'll tell you about in a moment. There's just a few of my, my books and few, my websites and things like that if you want to connect uh, with what we're doing. Um, I've written a, a few books, contributed to a few other books, and the most recent book is co-authored with Jim Vieira, and we're having a good time in his giant office there uh, in Massachusetts when we were filming for uh, Search for the Lost Giants a few years ago. And basically, we, uh, when we were researching our first book, Giants on Record, we were looking specifically really for skeletons, evidence of giants in North America, because there are so many accounts. We uncovered probably over a thousand, there's probably 1,500 we have on record now. From academic sources, we have photos, we have evidence, even from Smithsonian's own annual reports. But that's America. So what we're going to look at now is the area of the Bible lands and the legendary Nephilim and their predecessors, the Anunnaki and the Watchers. Now we're going to have a quick look at this because this is very significant in relationship to the new discoveries that are being made in southeast Turkey. This is actually a um, Israel and Lebanon, this is a, uh, just shows you where some of the skeletons have been unearthed in this part of the world. But really, when we're looking at the Bible lands, we're looking at the Book of Enoch, the Book of Giants, the Old Testament, there's hundreds of accounts of giants being real, existing, battling with each other. We have things like David and Goliath, we have the Nephilim, we have uh, Gog and Mag Gog Magog and so forth. Here's just some of the references. I'm not going to leave this up for too long, so grab a photo of it if you like, because we are finding so much activity in this part of the world when it comes to what we call the world of giantology that we are, we are quite impressed. Here's some actual accounts of skeletons and bones, and there's even evidence that uh, a very tall person called Goliath really existed. But what we're really looking at to start this talk, I want to show you that some really important discoveries from this part of the world, linked with a site called Gebekli Tepe. This is when I first visited there back in 2013 with Graham Hancock and Andrew Collins, and this is before they put the big roof on it. Um, but this part of the world has become kind of legendary because it fits in with all the stories that we find in the Old Testament and the Book of Enoch. We have this great story of the Anunnaki or the Ananage who came down from Mount Hermon and they instigated civilization and agriculture many thousands of years ago. And you probably heard Edmund Marriage, the late Edmund Marriage, who did, a, I believe, did a brilliant talk at the July, uh, or June or July lectures here at the Bases Project at the Bar Gym. He talked about this in depth, no doubt. But really, this part of the world is has this biblical kind of story about these very advanced beings coming down either from the sky or from this mountain top, shrouded in mist and developing and instigating civilization and many of the arts and sciences that we even know today. And a third wave of these beings were called the Watchers. And it was these who eventually, they were kind of like quite rebellious, and it was these who bred with human women and gave birth to what are called the Nephilim, or the fallen ones, which some translations have it as the giants, that could even mean that. And this is where all this technology, this stone building technology, metallurgy, and many other elements of agriculture, stone carving techniques, and everything else, were said to have really spread from that part of the world. And now, since the discovery of Gebekli Tepe in southeast Turkey uh, back in the mid-1990s, it's now thought that actually some of these stories may have some reality, that these Anunnaki and their offspring, the Nephilim and so forth, were actually the builders of these sites. Now, for those that don't know, this is an 11,600-year-old series of stone circles near the city of San Liofa, or Edessa, which is the ancient kind of biblical city of Abraham. And 
there's potentially up to 20, between 20 and 40 of these stone circular enclosures with these beautiful pillars carved out of solid limestone with humanoid features, 3D relief carvings of animals, and some remarkable kind of uh, stonework which shouldn't have been around at this time. According to tradition, according to archaeology, this was just the realm, the time of hunter-gatherers. So where did they get this technology from? Also, we have examples of very advanced astronomy built within the sites, linking with Cygnus and Sirius and the movement of the sun and moon. He just shows you Pillar 43. I'm just quickly running through this just to give you a brief outline of uh, Gebekli Tepe. But this one's particularly significant. This is, some people suggest this could represent the first or some of the earliest examples of astrological signs carved in stone. Others believed it has other types of symbolism, including JJ at the back there, who's done a lot of research on this. And Martin Sweatman, for instance, is absolutely convinced this is not just a map of the night sky in 11,600 BC, but actually is, and this is what Graham Hancock actually believes as well, that it may be kind of a, a link and providing us with what could be coming, i.e. some kind of cataclysm. Because it's believed these sites were built not long after the impact of the Younger Dryas event, which decimated North America and Canada about 12 to 13,000 years ago. This is some of the relief carvings we're finding at Gobekli Tepe. Um, and you can see the quality of the stonework is really quite remarkable. They're carving this out of solid, quite tough limestone. And there are hundreds of these, and they show really abstract artistic forms, which were not known pretty much anywhere in the world at this time. We even have serpent symbolism on the back of this head found at a site called Navali Churi, which is uh, one of the many sites that we find in this area. Navali Churi has been destroyed. It's now actually in the museum at San Liafa. He just shows you one of the strange portal stones with these 3D relief carvings of animals and even cut marks we find here as well, which is really a phenomenon we find mostly in Britain, but also different parts of the world. So it looks like it may have originated at south, this area of southeast Turkey. We have very strange alien-like statues. This is the Kassilic statue, which is just northwest of Gebekli Tepe. And you can see the strange head on that, which is similar to the, the heads we find on the Gebekli Tepe pillars, because many of them have arms and hands touching the navel, with the head is like an abstract kind of square or oblong form. There's even unfinished pillars in the quarry, which you cannot go to anymore. They've closed all this off. And we found, we just, we spotted this when we were actually in the museum in San Liafa back in 2015. This is a bone plaque, it's about three inches long. And it appears to depict two of the T Gebekli Tepe pillars, as well as a human being kind of looking towards them, almost like there's some kind of ceremonial kind of record carved on this small piece of bone. We even have this T shape is very interesting. Again, JJ's done more research on this than me, but we find it in places like the T shape here at Amaru Muru in Peru. So why are we finding these T-shapes as well? We find it also in places like Menorca, even though this is many thousands of years later. But there are many sites. This is just a handful of the sites of this pre-pottery Neolithic era. And since about 2014, I've been visiting another site called Karahan Tepe, which is southeast of Gebekli Tepe by about 40 miles in the Tek Tek Mountains. And, and you can see here that it's just all you have was a few of these pillars, the tops of these pillars sticking out of the ground. And this is because, as with Gebekli Tepe, this site was completely covered over. It was repaired, put back together, and then covered over and preserved, and only to, to be discovered in the last few years. This is the unfinished monolith, one of the T pillars with my friend Kevin, uh, when we were there back in 2014. I'm just going to show you this. This is actually a video I produced, but I'm going to kind of chat over the top of it. And this just shows you the location of it, which we've got this southern, southeast part of Turkey here. That's actually one of the heads 
that was found in what is a kind of pit with 11 pillars carved out of solid bedrock. That's what, that's what is being excavated now. I mean, when I was last there, that was completely covered over. And so you can see there's multiple enclosures. Here's some of the other sites. There's 12 sites, which they call Tastepola now, and they're promoting this for tourism. Um, and it's a Karahan Tepe and Gebekli Tepe are just two of 12 known sites. But in fact, there are about 30 sites. So this just shows you a couple of photos um, from Gebekli Tepe, the different eras, because they actually built mounds. They, they, they create this stone enclosure. This is Karahan Tepe uh, before it was excavated, just like the hills in these mountains made of rock. There's Andrew Collins, who we, we often go there with. Here are some of the T-pillars sticking out of the ground. But yeah, they deliberately cover over these sites, you know, and, and they repair them, fill them in really carefully with thousands of tons of rock and rubble. And here you can see the 75 feet wide enclosure that's just been exposed. I mean, we're literally going to be going here next week um, to look at these sites before um, they build this roof over it because that's what they're planning to do here. And so this is actually larger than any other enclosure at Gobekli Tepe. And you can see on the bottom left there, we have these 11 kind of standing stones, but carved out of solid bedrock. Here's one of the T-shaped pillars and the kind of benches around the side. But I think we just need to realize that this is a revelation. This is one of the most important archeological discoveries in the certainly in the last few years, but potentially in the last hundred years. The whole area around here has been hidden. It's been covered up, literally covered up with, by earth. And now, only now, the archeologists are realizing there's something quite remarkable, especially because of the age of these sites. And so we have to question who really built these sites and how did they have this advanced technology such a long time ago, building with this very specific geometry. They were using 4-3 acoustic style ratios. This is just uh, at the site before it was excavated, by the way. So this is just a, a clip I wanted to show you. This is what's currently inside one of the uh, enclosures. But they were using 4-3 kind of ratios, which is a harmonic with the human voice. They had very specific, very accurate astronomy. They were aligning things across the landscape. Here's the, uh, the sort of sacred kind of pillar pit, whatever you want to call it. And 10 of these are carved out of solid bedrock. You know, this is like just dug into the ground and, s and carved out. Only one of them is standing. Here we have some very unusual statues found at the site. And there's Andrew uh, and a couple of our friends at the site. So we can see that there's something quite interesting going on in Southeast Turkey. And traditionally, this is the area of the Garden of Eden, if you look back into especially Armenian Christian tradition. Some people say, like our good friend, the late Edmund Marriage, that it's in Karsag, or it's, sorry, it's down in Lebanon, further south in Lebanon. It's something my good friend Paul Bedson and I are going to go and investigate uh, next year, we hope. But traditionally, it's in southeast Turkey, going over the border into Armenia and slightly down into Syria. And this is the area where you know Noah was written about. This is the area where the Anunnaki was said to have thrived. This is the area that the Nephilim was said to have spread out from and kind of spread this art of megalithic construction, stone working techniques, and various other agricultural systems and things like this. So yeah, and this just shows you a couple of the alignments here. But anyway, we can see that there's something quite quite interesting going on in this area. And these, couple, these are a couple of stones uh, from Gebekli Tepe, and you can see the serpent symbolism here is, is prevalent. It's very strong. There's hundreds of carvings of serpents all over all of these sites, every single site, I think, that's been excavated. And what's interesting about this is that if you look into the tradition of like the Watchers, Anunnaki, you've got Enlil and Enki. Enki's symbol was the serpent uh, rising up, wrapping around uh, a staff or a pole. And we're seeing the same kind of symbolism here carved onto the rocks. In fact, this, the middle one here is Gebekli Tepe. The one on the left there, and this shows you the spread and influence we're talking about here. The one on the left is actually from Gozo. It's a place called Gigantia, which is a megalithic site, one of the oldest on the Maltese islands. 
that dates back to at least 3600 BC, but now new dating by Lenny Ridgick has pushed the dates even further back. We have the same symbol at Saqqara in Egypt, where the first pyramid was said to have been built. This is the actual symbol, the serpent of wisdom and healing, which was adopted as the kind of healing symbol of various uh, various modern or relatively modern cultures as well. But this is actually the first symbol of Enki, the leader of the Anunnaki, who then the Nephilim all came from. And so what's this got to do with giants and Britain? Well, there is some research that says that 6,000 years ago, or possibly much older in fact, that they found genetic connections between the Middle East, Turkey, continental Europe and Britain and some of the dates go back much further, go back to 10,000 years and this has been detected, this has been analysed and reported on by the mainstream media and mainstream archaeologists so there's this, been this talk for many years in the world of giantology that all the builders of the megalithic sites and all the giants found around the world are ancestors or descendants of the Nephilim. And there's evidence now that there was a movement out of Turkey, out of where the place we've been looking at, to other parts of the world. And you can see this is just the spread of where giants are being discovered from the Bible lands all the way up to ancient Britain. So let's just talk about uh, what we've been researching over the last couple of years, the giants of Stonehenge and ancient Britain. Here's a top 10 chart. We've just published a video if you want to check out our YouTube channel, the Megalithomania YouTube channel. And uh, we've actually done a top 10. It even includes a number zero, this really famous hoax that not many people realise is a hoax. But we have covered quite a lot of ground in our book. But Stonehenge is really the kind of centre of where this is all happening. Now, this is just kind of not too far from where we live actually. We live quite close to this area and that's one of our, our, our little groups we had in there a few years ago. And what we're finding here is not only a connection with the Bible lands, but the dating also fits as well. And this is one, one thing that's always sort of compelled me and kind of confused me, is what was once three painted circles in the car park, which is now they've marked, they've covered it over this oval with grass, are where three huge pine posts, possibly five in fact, were found and marked this east-west alignment. The thing is, these date back to 10,000 years old. So they were marking the location of Stonehenge with these giant potential totem poles 10,000 years ago. And this is very close, within 100 years of when they were covering over Gebekli Tepe and Karahan Tepe, and this movement was said to have come out from the Bible lands. And so there is this theory, I mean, I'm not 100% with this, we don't promote this too much in the book, but I thought it was appropriate because of the discoveries, I wanted to discuss if there's connections between these two areas. Now these really, really fascinate me, because why are they marking this site 10,000 years ago? And then why, about 4,500 years later, are they starting to build the stone circle we see there today? What, why is there this gap? And why was this site still revered after all these thousands of years? I'm literally asking you a question here, so if you have any answers, I would appreciate it. Because we just don't know. But we do know this area, and Amesbury, is the oldest continuous, continually inhabited area in Britain. And it has been, you've got places like Blickmead, which is where they found all these remarkable discoveries as well. You've got the Durrington area, the Durrington shafts that have been discovered. And you've got many other sites around there which are much, much older than people realise. And again, we see the same kind of sophistication we see at Gebekli Tepe. We see the same kind of astronomical alignments. We see the same kind of orientation the same stone working techniques. Now we don't have 3D relief carvings here, but there are a lot of artifacts that have been found in this area. But one of the things is just the geometry, the metrology, the measurement systems, and the astronomy are all very close to what we find in Southeast Turkey. We have very sophisticated technique of building Stonehenge. We don't find this in any other stone circle in Britain. It's the only one where we have carved shaped stones with lintels on top. Most stone circles, as we know, are not kind of like this. They're rough hewn stones. And we have you know, further connections from abroad with Stonehenge. One of the earliest traditions states that 
the stones of Stonehenge originally came from Africa, the farthest reaches of Africa. And this was documented in the 1100s in the history of the kings of Britain by Geoffrey of Monmouth and earlier in earlier texts as well. And the tradition states that the, these giants brought the stones from Africa to a place called Kilaroos in Ireland, where people aren't really sure where that is, but we, we go into where we think that is in the book. And thousands of years later, Merlin, King Ambrosius, and an army of 15,000 people were sent over to collect the stones from Kilaroos to bring them over to Salisbury Plain under the king's uh, rule, because it was to build a stone circle in honor of the defeated armies that had, in battles that had recently taken place. The army couldn't move one stone, they couldn't even lift one stone out of the ground, so they got Merlin to do the work. And he kind of used magic, or in other traditions, he used engines and different types of technology, even potentially levitation, to bring the stones over. And the interesting thing is that this giant depicted here, this is the earliest ever known depiction of Stonehenge. And the first name of Stonehenge that people that's, that's been recorded is the giant's dance. That is the early Ocoria Gigantum. And this is, again, this is put in these books in the 900s and the 1100s AD. And incidentally, JJ, when she was at Stonehenge, met the same giant. Look, <laughs> unbelievable. So he's still alive. I mean, this guy was like seven, over seven feet tall. And this is interesting because I, I call myself a giant hunter, yeah? And I was there. I didn't see the giant. JJ did. <laughs> And I wandered off somewhere, you know, and uh, what the hell? So JJ gets to meet the giant of Stonehenge. I don't. And yeah, so this is a beautiful illustration just showing you the movement from Africa, the stones to Ireland, then to Britain and so forth. I wanted to add that because it's a beautiful image. But what we also find in Africa, which is of interest in Libya specifically and Tunisia, uh, you know, people have always questioned, is there any truth in these stories of bringing the stones over from the farthest reaches of Africa? Well, when we see these, it makes you wonder, because all of these are found near Tripoli in Libya. And these are clearly kind of very Stonehenge-y, if you like. They even have mortise and tenon joints, like we find at Stonehenge as well. And Tunisia, we find similar things as well. Uh, we find the same kind of trilithons. And we even have Roman depictions of giants from Tunisia, which is odd, to say the least. But yeah, and again, we find similar types of construction all over this part of the world. There's another tradition at Stonehenge which fascinates me. This is the story of the Kangik giants. Now, this goes back to a book written in the 1600s, in fact, 1666 it was written, and by a Reverend Robert Gay, he was from Nettlecombe, Somerset, and for a long time, people didn't know who wrote the book. It was called A Fool's Bolt Soon Shot at Stonehenge. It wasn't published till 1725. And he, this book is a revelation, really. It's a really interesting book. We, we came across it, it was actually inside another book called Stonehenge Antiquities. And we were quite moved by it because it talked about a different story of the giants building Stonehenge. And this was linked with the Canaanites, possibly, of ancient, the ancient Bible lands, which is, you know, the descendants of the Anunnaki and the Nephilim. Because Kangik giants, Canaanites, the C-A-N, was noted, not just by him, but also people like William Camden and John Leland, who were respected voices at the time, who wrote the, book, the books Britannica and so forth. And one of the interesting stories in this, not only all over Somerset where these were supposed to be based, but mainly up on the Mendip Hills, but it said that they would defeat, they had a battle and they defeated some invading armies and went west to build a monument in honour of their victory. And this monument was Stonehenge. Now, this is written back in the 1600s, and it's very matter-of-fact, it's a very unusual story, but we, we, we dug into it and found other references which backed up there was a tribe with this name in Somerset, potentially two and a half thousand or more years ago. What's also interesting is that he spoke about this unusual aspect of 
one of the ways they would build and, and, and construct megalithic sites and that they would soften the stone, turn it into powder and then reconstruct it into the stones we see at Stonehenge and even at other stone circle sites like Stanton Drew. Now I found that really interesting because we have the work of J Joseph Davidovitz, uh, the Geopolymer Institute who claims that the pyramids were built using cast stones, not carved. And then, but if you actually go to Stonehenge and have a look around carefully inside, you can see what looks like stones have been softened and then scooped. And this is like a tradition we don't just find here. But this is just one of the stones, but you have to go inside. You can't really see this on a traditional day out at Stonehenge. You have to get access inside the stones. And again, we have other scoop marks here on some of the stones, which haven't really been explained. This is the same stone we saw at the, the first one, and we have other kind of indentations. We even have what looks like a shepherd's crook carved on this one here, which is what we find in places like Karnak and Portugal, which some of the stone circles there go back to 6,000, 7,000 years old. The top three there are Stonehenge, and so you can see this kind of scooping on the stones. The bottom left, that's Machu Picchu in Peru. The bottom right, we have Aswan Quarry in Egypt. And this is the tip of the iceberg. I mean, there's many other places. There's many sites in Peru and Egypt and other countries that have exactly the same style of stone construction and scooping on them. And so this is really interesting that we have this story that goes back to the 1600s of them doing this technique. And then you can actually see it in the stones of the stone circle they were said to have constructed. I find that very odd. There's also the fact that they were said to have built Stanton Drew stone circle. We know that that circle is made of like conglomerate stone with pebbles within it. And so we can see that actually when you go to the site. And also it fits in with the, the stories of the Cyclops of ancient Greece who said they could also soften stone, turn it to powder and then reconstruct it and shape it however they wanted. And it was one of the secret traditions that was supposedly passed down from the Canaanites, who were the descendants of the Nephilim, the Anunnaki, and so forth. And so we have all these little connections that keep forming as we were going through our research. He just shows you some of the giant discoveries we made in the kind of Wiltshire, Hampshire area. This one is from very close to Stonehenge, and this is from 1719. And this talks about a nine foot four inch skeleton which was unearthed from a mound that was called the Giant's Grave, just inside Salisbury, very close to where the art center is now. This is just one discovery. We found two or three accounts of this same story. What happened to the skeleton, we don't know. But we have this one here. This again mentions um, Thomas Elliot, who was very well known. You probably know who he is. He was a respected scholar, writer. He wrote the dictionary of all books. Um, and amongst other things. And he was a member of parliament for Cambridge. He became knighted as well. And him and his father in around 1508 or 1510 talk about a discovery at a place called Ivy Church Priory, which is just near Salisbury. So it was in the, within the Stonehenge greater landscape. And he was blown away because he recorded seeing, and when they were digging the grounds of this priory, a 14 foot 10 inch skeleton, which is really quite tall. Um, and there's just an illustration our good friend Dan Lish put together. But what you'll, you'll notice in this illustration as well is that when they found this skeleton, they found this strange book at the legs of the skeleton, which crumbled to dust. And they found this large metal disc made of tin and lead. And both of these, the book, and the large metal kind of lid, whatever it was, had inscriptions on it which they couldn't decipher. Even Thomas Eliot, there was even John Leland looked at it, um, William Camden, these are all well-known authors and scholars at the time. So three very well-known, respected people witnessed this skeleton. Now they claim it was anywhere between 12 foot 10 and 14 foot 10 in the five different accounts we found of this story. Again, what happened to the skeleton, we don't know. And what happened to this metal disc. If anyone comes across that, we'd like to see it, please, because that would be interesting 
and what was on it, what was carved on it. Was it some kind of Canaanite script or something else? Well, we suggest it might be because there are, tradi there are traditions that go back to even before this time in the 1400s that talk about um, a Canaanite giant being paraded around Salisbury. Now, this is, get, this is where it gets kind of weird. Um, this is actually a picture of myself and JJ in the Salisbury Museum. You can go there. It's the one next to the cathedral. And there's a giant, 18-foot giant, that's called St. Christopher. And he has been paraded around Salisbury since the mid-1400s. And everyone questioned, well, why is this? And then we looked at the date it was paraded around. It was paraded around St. John the Baptist Day, which is just after the summer solstice. So we thought, that's odd. I mean, with the Stonehenge connection just literally up the road. And he was, uh, before this, he wasn't called St. Christopher. The St. Christopher name became a later addition in the 1700s. But he was just this pagan giant who originally stood at 24 feet tall, the original St. Christopher's paraded around Salisbury around the time of the summer solstice and then you know, a few years later after this begins they find this 14 foot 10 inch giant and a couple of hundred years they find a 9 foot 4 inch giant. So did they know about this tradition of giants existed in this area? The fact that Stonehenge was once called the Giant's Dance as well. So in the 1700s they changed his name, he became Saint Christopher and I, well, we, me and Jim questioned well, why is this? Why would they call him a saint. And then we realized St. Christopher is a Canaanite giant who came over from the Bible lands. And he was said to be anywhere between seven and a half feet, 18 feet tall. He's famous for being the patron saint of traveling. And a lot of people who do a lot of traveling, you get even surfers and skiers and other such things, have his badge or they have a kind of little thing in their wallet of St. Christopher to help protect them on their journey. Also, he was famous for carrying the baby Jesus across a river because he was so tall he could get him across. Um, and we found all these different references to him in all these biblical uh, books, these biblical traditions that claim he was of this stature. So what is he? Why, is his, why was he called that? I mean, the connections become really odd because he was directly, he was a Canaanite. He was one of the warriors of a Canaanite army who was thought to be giants, the descendants of the Nephilim. Suddenly his image or his kind of pageant dedicated to him turns up in this part of the world. So yeah, I don't know what to, quite what to make of that, but the connection seemed to be pretty strong. Even the Queen um, is a giantologist in her spare time, and you, you can see that here. This is actually the uh, Charles Byrne. This is the famous Irish giant who lived a few hundred years ago. Um, and th we thought that was a great picture because we found out that Prince, or Prince Philip, the late Prince Philip, had a, he was really into UFOs and aliens. Did you hear about that? Well, we d I did, yeah, somehow. And so we believe the Queen's into giants. We think that's her thing, you know, but that's just a, just a theory. Um, but we've come across huge amounts of accounts. So we'll move away from Stonehenge just for a moment. But this is just some of the, the news reports we uncovered in our research. We have about 250 of these in, the, in the, the new book. All over the country, going into Ireland, Scotland and Wales, are these very strong traditions of these giants. Not just skeletons and bones being reported, measured, documented by well-known people. But even you know traditions where in some places we're finding where there's a legend often the bones and skeleton are found connected with it this just shows you the map that our good friend Dan Lish put together and one of our big inspirations some of you may know his work is that of Anthony Roberts now, he was a Glastonbury guy he uh, lived there he lived till 50 years old he died actually on the tour in 1990 but he wrote this book called Sowers of Thunder and one of the aspects that we're finding with these giant myths especially is the fact that not only were these giants apparently kind of sorcerers or magicians or shamans, they had control of the weather, they had high levels of magic and all these traditions, if you go back far enough, you find these all over all four countries of the British Isles. 
even like we go back to the stories of Albion and the founding of Britain, this is like the, the famous William Blake, William Blake um, image of Albion. And he was said to have, you know, the story states that he, he was like the, the begotten son of Neptune or Poseidon. Uh, but he became like this archetypal patriot of ancient Britain, you know, holding on to the spiritual pagan traditions of Britain, which was being decimated by Christianity at the time that William Blake was around. Interesting, we have, we have other foundation myths of Britain. We have, obviously, we have Brutus the Trojan, who battled the giant Gog Magog and his marauding giants in the southwest of the country. But we also have this story. This is the story of Albina, or Albina. And she was a giantess, and her, her and her 32, 33 of them in total, sisters, were banished from their homeland in Greece. And they made their way over to Britain, where they were alone. There was no one else in the country at the time. And eventually, these demonic entities, called the Incubi, bred with these women, and they gave birth to these really grotesque giants. And it got to a point where they were, it got a bit crazy. They were kind of then breeding between themselves and then with their sons, and, and it, bec it became a bit of a kind of incestual party going on here. But what happened was, it means a whole race of giants emerged in the British Isles. And Gog Magog was one of the final ones from this very early story. So we have very similar story to the Nephilim of the Bible lands, where it's said that in some accounts, the earliest accounts that the Watchers, which is one branch of the Anunnaki, bred with human women. But these were, you know, these, these kind of Anunnaki were often referred to as like semi-divine or demonic entities themselves. So we have almost parallels going on here. It's even said that Merlin, who was, is depicted in the earliest image of Stonehenge here, was actually fathered by one of these incubi, possibly one of the ancestors of Albina. And if you look into the early, earliest records of Merlin, he's connected with this whole story as well. And even back in the 1400s, we have accounts of people digging up bones and skeletons and skulls. It's not just l more recent newspaper reports. And so it is quite, quite a strange story when you start getting into this. I mean, clearly we have, uh, this is a classic image of uh, Corinius, who was Brutus the Trojan's kind of warrior, throwing Gog Magog off the cliff um, down in the southern coast of the southwest. But interestingly, even here, where we have this story of where this was supposed to have happened on Plymouth Hoe, they actually found um, a gigantic jaw and teeth found in this actual spot where this legendary event was supposed to have happened. So with little things like this kind of, you know, you have to take notice of. Now, they well, soon after that, when apparently Corinius and Brutus took Gog Magog, they kept him alive and took him to London. He became two, he became Gog and Magog. And now they are the protectors of Britain. They are the protectors of London, placed now in the Guild Hall, which is interesting in itself because this is where lots of the ancient maps, the ancient records, the ancient kind of traditions are really kept. And even at the Guildhall itself, they actually found a giant rib bone was found there. Sorry, a thigh bone was found there. Actually, and it was on display in the Guildhall itself. So it gets weirder the more you look into this, the sort of reality meeting legend. But this area here, this is really the realm of the Kangik giants who we talked about earlier. And we have very, we have a huge amount of so-called discoveries, a giant's thigh bone a yard long in Sturton Corndall, which is on the border with Dorset, uh, other areas of Somerset. Uh, we have other different accounts, different stories. I'm not going to go into all of these, but basically we're talking about some really odd, really interesting discoveries linked with these so-called Kangik giants. If we move to Wales, I'm not sure what I'm doing for time here, probably 20 minutes or something. If we move to Wales, 10 minutes. So if we move to Wales, we've got a really interesting story, again, which is kind of reminiscent of what we've been seeing here in England, pretty much. And these were called the Children of Doan. Now, I don't know if any of you have heard of these. Have any of you heard of the Children of Doan or Children of Don? Okay. 
So these are, this is a really interesting story. This is brought to our attention again by Anthony Roberts in his book Atlantean Traditions in Ancient Britain. And like the kind of Tuedi Danan or the Fomorians of Ireland or you know, some of the stories of the founding of England, we have what's described as the superhuman, immortal, strong and vital, giant kind of royal elite arriving in the lands of Wales from this lost, sunken land. So it's almost got Atlantean connections, or it's got connections, they, they were even said in some traditions to come from the line of Noah. And so we have this sort of biblical Atlantean kind of thing where they're survivors of this sunken land. And they, they kind of settled in Gwynedd, North Wales. This area is particularly interesting uh, because not only do we have the stories of Hugh Gadan, who was one of the founding kind of giants, again, of ancient Wales. But he was said to have come from Turkey, of all places, the Bosphorus area. And, so, and he brought agriculture, and he brought kind of what's called the plough, which is basically a reference to agriculture, to ancient Wales. And so he was a really interesting character. And these are the four ancient books of Wales. Um, which were all brought together a few years ago, and this photo, thank God, was taken. And these really bring all these legends together. Um, and this, they talk about the stories of Taliesin and these different traditions which you may have heard about. But they were really interesting characters. This is like one of their strongholds. This is uh, Dinas Emerys. And they were masters of magical forces and wanderers from this lost land. And they wielded magic as normally as later warriors wielded swords. And they brought these arts and sciences with them. So some people have suggested these may be linked with these people from the Bible lands, the Anunnaki, the Watchers, the Nephilim, and so forth. One of their strongholds was Kadir Idris, which is, or Idris, which is one of the most interesting areas. I've been here twice, actually. My, my, me and my friend Hugh Evans went there most recently. He's written a book about this area. And the giant Idris, or Idris, was said to have lived on top of this mountain. And he was, according to tradition, one of the holy astronomers of Britain. And from his mountain top fortress, he could survey the whole country and see as far back to the beginning of time and see forward to the end of time. So he was thought, rem remarked on as being one of the most sophisticated astronomers in the world at the time. Here's an image that we, we did of him, which we thought was interesting, because one of the translations of Idris or Idris is Enoch. So we're looking at this biblical story. In fact, one of the traditional names is Enoch's chair is the top of the mountain, or Enoch's throne. So we kind of depicted this in this image here. And we have some of these sacred lakes. There's several of these sacred lakes all over the mountain. One of them is called Lin Kao, where a water dragon was said to existed and he would devour all those that came into the area and it was King Arthur who actually defeated him and so we have all these different stories I mean I'm not going to go into too much here with the, the time restraints but basically this to us this is one of the most important aspects of our studies when it comes to the giants of Britain because we're finding this strange connection again with the Bible lands and actually, in the 1600s, at this farm, which is just at the base of the mountain, um, they found, guess what, some giant skeletons. Two giant skeletons over seven foot tall each, right next to the mountain where the giant Idris was said to have ruled from. Now the thing about Idris, or Enoch, he was also, in tradition, you go back into the Muslim traditions of the Bible, he was the founder of geomancy. So we're talking about dowsing, we're talking about laying out sites across the landscape, we're talking about working with the energies of the earth. And interestingly, the two skeletons that were found at the base of Kadir Idris had huge hazel dowsing rods in their burial. This was reported in the 1600s. We went to the farm, we spoke to the, the owners, and they, they, they heard all, they knew all about this. We, they weren't there at the time, but we got a letter back from them. Like we posted a letter through their door, and they said, yep, this is for real, this really was discovered. We don't know where they are now, but they were there. So this kind of thing, you know, it just fascinates us. We go into all this in the book in more detail, obviously. This is just a shot of Kadi Idris. You can see the top of the seat on the left up there. That's kind of the giant seat. This is the actual account. 
from uh, from 16 uh, 1600s and talks about exactly what what I just said so we have more connections with the Bible lands in the area of Karahan Tepe and Gebekli Tepe there is a mound the mound of Idris and so we've actually been there before it's actually near the great Haran tower that we have here uh, or called Tel Idris in the traditional and this goes back to 10,000 years old and so and he was prevalent there it, he was known as Idris more than he was Enoch in this part of the world and we have this classic image of William Blake again another picture of Enoch here but the book of Enoch is where it gets really interesting I'm going to kind of just cover all this before we finish because it gets there's a direct connection with ancient Britain that appears to be spoken about written about in the book of Enoch we know this famous quote here and I saw in those days how long cords were given to the angels or the watchers and they took themselves wings and flew and went towards the north and I asked an angel this is Enoch asking saying unto him why have they taken cords and gone off and he replied they have gone to measure and these measures shall reveal all the secrets of the depths of the earth. This is written in the book of Enoch. This is like a, you know, the famous book that was rediscovered in the 1700s. And then he goes into these, you can read this if you like, but he goes into these huge details about going to these northern latitudes, these specific areas where he sits between and, and looks through portals where the heavens open to other heavens and so forth. And, there were, and also he talked about the weather, which I thought was interesting. Uh, winds, cold, hail, snow, dew and rain, which is very reminiscent of what we have in the British Isles, obviously. And then he describes, like, looking through these portals. And what it appears is that he, if, it, if this is a real kind of story, it's kind of referencing something that may have actually happened, then Robin Heath did some brilliant research on this, published in his book Sun, Moon and Stonehenge in 1999, which was then duplicated and copied by Robert Lomas and Christopher Knight in Uriel's Machine. You may have read that book, um, but Robin got there first. He's, this is the research I'm looking at here. And he believes, and through the descriptions in the Book of Enoch, it's like Enoch is one of the trainees of the Watchers who built the site, who were involved in the construction, they were probably finished laying it out and they were testing the astronomy. And he was busy trying to write it all down because Enoch was known as a scribe and trying to describe what was being witnessed. And basically, he was witnessing as though he was sitting in Stonehenge, looking through the gaps between the stones, observing all these movements of the stars actually happening. And, you know, he took this one step further, Robin, and he believes that he's actually found the exact spot where Enoch must have been sitting to record all this. And he even worked out the latitude in the descriptions of where this would be. And this was within about 20 miles of Stonehenge. So little things like this, these connections are really, really intriguing. And this whole analysis was done later on. This is the, uh, the astronomical data that was recorded by Enoch in the Book of Enoch. And you can see how close Enoch's data is to Stonehenge on the top right there. And this is the spot he was supposed to have observed it from. So we've got this really strange thing going on here. And we kind of, we go into, we do all this in the book. We had Robin help us with this part of the, the final chapter because it's clear that there's somehow these traditions of Idris in Wales are directly connected with Enoch from the Bible lands, as well as all the other stuff we've discussed this afternoon. And if you look at the book of Taliesin, which was recorded in one of the four books of ancient Wales, he actually states, this is the Bard Taliesin, this is, I quote this, I was instructor to Eli or Enoch. That's written in this book from like the, what, the 11 or 1200s. Mabinogion as well has similar stories in it as well. Robert Graves wrote about this, you know, the same kind of principles here, that there was this kind of strange connection between these the writings of Taliesin in these early books and these stories we even have a place called Carn Enoch up on uh, in the Pacelli mountains of Wales this is where the blue stones of Stonehenge come from and these are calendrical marks on these stones that go back to at least the Neolithic era um, and so why is it called Carn Enoch number one I mean where did that name even come from even up on Kalanish we have stories here this is up on the Outer Hebrides in Scotland and there's a very interesting myth here because, 
And we, we even get similar stories at Newgrange. I'm not going to have time to go into this, but we do in the book, where even Newgrange itself, it has these traditions of these watcher-type people in these feathered robes arriving and kind of discussing. This is actually in the Book of Enoch, discussing the movements of the stars and the layout and orientations of sites and so forth. We have it here at Kalanish as well, where there's a tradition that on Midsummer's Day, there was a, a certain shining one walked along the avenue um, with the, you know, who came from Ternanog, the Celtic land of youth, one of the lost islands. And it's said that he walked along with all these men with him along this alignment through Kalanish, who wore, who wore robes of bird skins and feathers. And this is the same thing. If you look into the biblical traditions of the Watchers and the Anunnaki, they all wear bird skins and feathers. And this is one of the stories we find in many of these ancient books of the Bible. And so I think that's... Um, I think there's quite a lot to consider when we're looking at these strange connections and the fact that we're finding all these actual giant skeletons in relationship to many of these sites. Now, people question, I'll just finish up with this. Um, people question, you know, are these stories real? Is there any evidence of this? Well, possibly. I mean, I can't, we can't say for sure because much of history has been deleted from the history books, much evidence that has been deleted, and we've got proof of that. We know that for sure. Like when we did our research in North America, we know about the Smithsonian problem, where they were removing all the skeletons. They disappeared thousands of skeletons. But we have like things like this that have been deleted out of the history books. This is from an old book, a few, a couple of like hundred years old or so. And Cro-Magnon Man, who was said to have emerged from nowhere 44,000 years ago in Europe, was routinely over seven feet tall, but that's now been deleted and changed on Wikipedia to six foot two at the tallest. And yet there are hundreds of skeletons being found in Europe which match this from this era, so even 44,000 years ago. Before that, we have Homo hodobagensis, South Africa and Europe. These were between seven and 10 feet tall. This isn't talked about very much, but we've got evidence of this. And even before that, we have the Denisovans of Siberia, whose DNA has been found in the giants of North America who had a very high technology about 100,000 years ago. And this just shows you some of the teeth here. And so what we're looking at here is a very ancient tradition which has been deliberately kind of suppressed, removed from the history books. And yet, if you dig deep enough, you go into the old records, you can try and decode these myths to the best of your ability, you can find there's a really, really interesting story here. So thanks for listening. Appreciate it. Cheers.